when I was in college, I took a class with a friend on biblical archaeology. Now, my friend had just been had been just as involved in his reform Jewish congregation in Cincinnati through high school and beyond as I had been in my humanistic Jewish congregation. We had both had our mitzvahs and confirmations. We attended class all the way through 12th grade, long after most of our classmates had left it behind. But when we did this class with an academic approach, I know academic sounds like a dirty word now, but an academic, an academic approach to the earliest Jewish history, questioning the validity of the biblical literature as compared to Babylonian literature and archaeological evidence, challenging the historicity of the Exodus and the patriarchs, who wrote parts of the Bible and when and why, what was their agenda, what was the setting for when they actually wrote it down. Well, to my friend with his deep background in Reformed Judaism, this was all news to him. And it was mostly nothing new for me. Now, his rabbi and my rabbi went to the same seminary. They were both educated and worked for a time in Reformed Judaism. They maybe even had the same professors at the Hebrew Union College. So what was the difference? Well, my rabbi wanted his congregation, wanted his students, whether children or adults, to know the real history of the Jews as best we could discover. Not just the traditional version. Where did the Jews really come from? How did they emerge out of the stage of history? Who really wrote the Torah if it wasn't Moses on Sinai taking dictation? <laughs> what happens to Jewish history if you consider the process of secularization and change as always a key part of the Jewish experience and not simply a modern development and not a break with the past? Rabbi Sherwin T. Wine took the pursuit of truth very seriously. Truth in philosophy, truth in science, and the truth of the history of his people. In that library across the way, now named after him, Sherwin White taught the real history of the Jews year after year. Their origins in Canaanite culture, not from outside, but from inside the Canaanite context, where the Canaanites were their cousins and not a distant enemy, as the Bible would have you believe. The emergence of an Israelite monarchy, not by divine decree, but by human necessity. The destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, its rebuilding under the Persians, ultimately its destruction again under the Romans. The real clash between the Maccabees on one side and Hellenized Jews on the other. And after all, which side would we be on in that battle between Hellenized and Maccabean Jews? The agendas of the early rabbis as they created the Mishnah and the Talmud, why would they write it this way? Why did they include these ideas? What did the surrounding history and events have to do with the creation of these documents? They were not from Sinai. They were not magic. They were human. They were made by people. And people are influenced by the events around them. He would teach about the far-flung diasporas created by the Jewish participation in medieval mercantile culture between the world of Islam and the world of Christianity and even beyond these into the Far East. We describe with vivid drama the tensions and dynamics of the European Enlightenment and the process of emancipation. He was very sensitive to the rise of modern anti-Semitism, the dislocations, disasters, and triumphs of the Jewish experience in the 19th and 20th century. And in every class, you would hear Sherwood's inimitable style. You would have the leading, what? The leading questions. <laughs> you would have a whole series of outlines with one word for each topic that he would then develop into pages and pages of notes. So you're trying desperately to cram your writing into the space left in the one word that he needs to trigger all of these memories. You have his hand-drawn maps with the dry erase marker on the board, a couple of which are reproduced in the book, by the way. You have his summary charts at the end, where everything fits in one box with one word, and summarizing the time periods and neat dates that are always precise. 
Now, the style doesn't always translate into the book. But one of the successes, I think, of a provocative people, a secular history of the Jews, has been that you can't always hear the laugh, but you can feel the voice, and you can experience the wisdom. There are a lot of places in the book where you are struck by Sherwood's amazing erudition in world history and culture. He draws parallels and examples from widely disparate parts of the human experience to make his point, and sometimes brilliantly so. And so as one example, he compares the Pharisees, who were the ancestors of the rabbis who lived in the second and first centuries BCE in the land of Israel, he compares the Pharisees to the Calvinists, who lived 1,500 years later in the middle of Europe, influenced by the Protestant Reformation. And here is his parallel between the Pharisees and the Calvinists. They were both contemptuous of the old religious establishment, hostile to the old aristocracy, populist in their insistence on turning lay people into priests, bourgeois in their class resistance and ambitions for power, conformist in their love of surveillance, self-righteous in their dismissal of the opinions of their opponents, fervent in their articulation of judgment day, reward, and punishment, and ardent in their obedience to their own newly created clergy. I don't know that anyone else has ever compared Pharisees <laughs> to the Calvinists. But, but when you line up those features, there are a lot of parallels. And if you don't know much about the Pharisees, but you know something about Calvinists, or you don't know much about the Calvinists, but you know something about Pharisees, you can learn about both in both directions. He does a wonderful job of setting the context in world history for what happens in Jewish life. You'll find a, a one-page summary of, of the varieties of Christian sects and heresies, and what each of them believed, and how that related to the ethnic schisms in the Eastern Christian world, and then how that related to the Jewish experience living under each of these <laughs> denominations of Christian heresy. He has these asides on diverse Jewish cultures, the Jews of India, Ethiopia, Romania, and they show, it's like he's read five books on that topic alone, and just condensed it into one or two pages. Here's another detour along the way. Now, as was mentioned before, Sherwin had a wonderful ability to synthesize a vast amount of information into a very clear system. So I remember, even from learning this from him in a class and then seeing it in the book, I was very pleased to see it. He points out that very often, Jews living in multilingual contexts will learn the language of the dominant power. In Montreal, they learned English, and they spoke English at home. In Prague, they spoke not Czech, they spoke German, because it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. In North Africa, they learned to speak French, and they spoke French at home. Again, who would draw these parallels from all these periods of history? But it's a wonderful example of the pattern of Jewish life. Or as another example, you'll sometimes hear in Jewish life that Jews aren't told what they have to believe. They simply are told what they're supposed to do. But he knew that was a lot. He knew that there are plenty of parts of Jewish life that tell you what you're supposed to think. And so he found a wonderful way to sum it up. There's a prayer that's recited in Orthodox and Conservative and in a, a variety, in an altered version in Reform synagogues as well. It's something called the Amidah, the standing prayer. And his point is very simple. At the heart of the rabbinic prayer service was the rabbinic creed. The assertion that Orthodox Judaism had no creed is false. Both the Shema and the Amidah, the core elements of the morning and afternoon prayers, the evening prayer featured only in the Amidah, they present creedal statements disguised as praise. The first two blessings of the Amidah affirm the doctrines of inherited merit, and the resurrection of the dead in the following way. Blessed are you, Lord our God, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's called the Avot. And the idea is it's inherited merit. You are good only because your ancestors were very good. And second, blessed are you, Lord our God, who revives the dead. That's a statement of you, you're thanking him for doing what you believe he's going to do. And the remaining blessings of the Amidah conclude in a similar way with creedal affirmations about the nature of God. He listens to prayer. He will bring his Messiah. He will restore the temple and his sacrificial services. 
If the recitation of these words was not required as an act of public conformity, then they would not be a creed. But they are. The best demonstration I've ever seen of making that point. Now, Sherman had a marvelous sense of humor. He loved to make you laugh. He loved to make himself laugh. And so there are a couple of passages in the book where you hear that humor coming out. I want to share just two of them with you. You'll find many more for yourself. The first one is when he describes the God of the Enlightenment. He's describing Spinoza and his pantheism, and then he also turns to something called deism, which is very popular among many of the founding fathers of this country. Spinoza's pantheism was one of two attempts to make God compatible with the scientific age. The other was deism. Most Enlightenment philosophers were deists, as was Thomas Jefferson. Deists maintained that God created the world and established the laws of nature which govern it. Having done so, he retired, a deity emeritus, <laughs> and is unavailable to intervene to change anything that the order of the universe arranges. Prayer is useless. Talking to God is like talking to the wall. The behavioral consequences of deism, pantheism, and atheism are all the same. What, you know, why, why make a difference when the consequence, the result is the same? But I've never heard anyone refer to a deity emeritus, <laughs> which is a marvelous way to summarize the concept. Or another one, when he was describing some of the difficulties of Jews living under the Persian Empire. One of the dilemmas living under the Persians was sometimes there was a culture clash. In this case, it wasn't polytheism and monotheism, or polygamy and monogamy. In this case, it was something else. Most cultures feature either burial or cremation. But Persian culture, like Tibetan culture, ultimately preferred exposure to vultures. <laughs> Bodies were simply left to be eaten in sacred places frequented by hungry birds of prey. The reason for this choice is lost in dim antiquity. But the Zoroastrian priests of the Persians offered a religious justification. They claimed that earth and fire were sacred and must not be defiled by the dead. Traditional Jews have a hard time dealing with cremation. You can just imagine how they must have responded to vultures. <laughs> but above all, Sherman's style and his class, and this comes out also in the book, is the ability to tell a story and to make it vivid and gripping. One of the most profound losses to humanistic Judaism, to the Birmingham Temple, to adult learners in the metropolitan Detroit area, to many of us personally, was the loss of that booming voice, that penetrating intellect, all of that knowledge and information, that beautiful mind, that legacy born of learning and then teaching. Now it's not all gone, of course. As he always reminded us, we live on on the lives we touch, the minds we learn from our ideas, inspired by them. He has been recorded in video and audio. You can find some of it online. Go to YouTube and search for Sherwin Wine. You'll see him teaching his classes. You can listen to it at learnoutloud.com. You can find other materials from past colloquia hosted by the Institute, and so on and so on. And now, also, you can find it in this book, in a provocative people. Now, Sherwin described his own project. Over the last two centuries, a great deal of evidence has been accumulated to create an alternative Jewish story. The origins of the Jewish people, the origins of the Bible, the evolution of priestly Judaism, the development of Talmudic Judaism, the realities of Hellenistic Jews, all of these important chapters in Jewish history which have been distorted by the lenses of mythology and theological apologetics now have alternative stories. In some ways, the new alternatives are less romantic because the gods have been reduced to ideas in human minds, and their passionate and whimsical agendas are absent from the tale. In other ways, the new stories are more interesting and exciting because they are not merely the repetition of familiar religious doctrine. Oh, Moses took them out of Egypt? Oh, Moses took them out of Egypt. What's new and exciting? Flesh and blood people of the narrative are no longer the passive victims of divine manipulation but rather the authors and creators of the events themselves. The new history is full of surprises. It may be the case that the patriarchs and matriarchs are purely legendary. It may be the case that the exodus from Egypt is a theological fabrication. It may be the case that the fundamental cultural influence in early Jewish life was not monotheistic and prosaic, but polytheistic and Canaanite. 
It may also be the case that the biblical prophets recommended a lifestyle that was profoundly at odds with the economic and social direction of Jewish history. In fact, the sacred literature of the Jews was unsympathetic from the very beginning to the mercantile role of the Jews in Western history. Well, this book was originally conceived many years ago. It's been in the works, works for a long time. It's been on my desk for a long time. <laughs> now, as Richard mentioned, there was a tremendous project done simply to assemble the materials, to make sure it was in order, to make sure we had the right versions in the right order. We have manuscript pages, we have printed out hand corrected pages, we have the printouts of those corrected pages, we have computer files, bibliography files, and timeline files. But then, of course, those were all the separate files. You then have to take the footnotes from the footnote file and put them into the chapter file where they go. And then the text box is filed. The text box in the text, so you can see. And of course, these were handwritten over many months. And so it's understandable that sometimes phrases, ideas would be repeated because they had been written several sheets in a long time before. But when you put them all on the same page, you see, oh, he said the same thing. Or occasionally he said the opposite thing. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to find a way to make them both true. <laughs> you have to make it clear. Okay. You have to try to make it flow. So that was done, but then we had to read it over for grammar and typos and commas and spellings and scare quotation marks. What to do with supporting sources? Richard was right. I didn't want to make it in my voice. I wanted it to be Sherwin's voice. But I also wanted someone in the Jewish world who reads this book to believe that humanistic Jews in general, because they brought out this book, believe in finding evidence for what they believe. And not just asserting it. They, I didn't want them to think this was our new mythology, that it came out of nowhere. And so I did find some sources, but I put them in the box, in small print. It doesn't interrupt the flow of the narrative. If you want to find out facts, you can find out facts. Sherwin himself did create bibliographies for almost every chapter that we were able to find, and those were in the back of the book, again, not to interrupt the flow of the story. The goal is the story should flow, and it does. We also had to decide, at times, how to manage what I would call the internal debates. Um, in Mitch Albom's Tuesdays with Maury, he says that death ends a life, not a relationship. I found that death ends a life, not a disagreement. <laughs> so, for example, um, in one of Sherwin's uh, descriptions about the beginnings of the synagogue, which he dates to uh, shortly after the Babylonian exile, around 500 BCE, when most scholars, which is what every scholar of the ancient synagogue, dates to the first century BCE or the second century BCE, Sherwin had a comment where he said, well, most scholars think this, but that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so then he goes on. That one I love. But there was one I couldn't leave alone. There was one part of his life where Sherwin was a creationist and not an evolutionist. And that had to do with humanistic Judaism. From Sherwin's perspective, humanistic Judaism was created in 1963. Boom. The reality of the evidence, as far as I've been able to read it, is that the Birmingham Temple was founded in 1963 as a reformed congregation, and it evolved over the next several months into a humanistic congregation. I've read contemporaneous records, I've investigated primary sources. It's the best that I can reconstruct that early history. So in the book he says, humanistic Judaism began in 1963. Do I make that a four? <laughs> I left it a three, but I put a footnote at the bottom to explain my take. And then there was the design, and the layout, and the proofing, and the proofing, and the proofing. And there were still mistakes, but that's life. Finding the maps, we were able to obtain, we found actually in the pile of papers, a list of maps that you had wanted from uh, a wonderful graphic artist named Martin Gilbert, who has a whole series of atlases of Jewish and general history, so we were able to get permissions to use those. 
And then we had to go send it to the printer, and then wait for the proofs, and then wait for the books, and wait and wait. And now, finally, it's here. From the Institute, the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, from Milan Press. I want to offer, by the way, special recognition to Bill Roberts and Ron Milan of the Milan Foundation for their ongoing support of the publication work, uh, not only for this book, but for our entire movement, and insistence, and proofing, and editing, and bringing this to light. Could not have happened without them. But now it's here. Now I'm not going to give away what happens in the book. <laughs> You'll have to read it for yourself. You want to read the book, I want you to read the book. But I do want to share with you a couple of themes that run through the sweep of the Jewish experience as told by Sherwin Wong that may yet provide insight and inspiration in our days and beyond. The first is that what is Jewish about Judaism is the Jews, the Jewish people. What ties together the animal sacrifice of Zadok and Judaism, the neo-Hellenistic philosophy of Maimonides, the pre-Torah polytheism of the first temple monarchy period, the Jewish mystical school of Kabbalah, and the enlightenment inflected rationalism of 19th century reform Judaism? It isn't theology that they have in common, it isn't ritual practice, it isn't liturgy, it isn't lifestyle. We as Jews have been everything from farmers and shepherds to priests to merchants to warriors to urban intellectuals. Sherwin put it very well. Jews in general are more comfortable with shepherd ancestors like Abraham and Isaac than with craftsmen, merchants, and moneylenders. But shepherds had very little to do with most of Jewish history. And merchants and money were omnipresent. It may be the case that the Jews, as the precursors of capitalism and an urban society, may be more important than the Jews as the inventors of a new theology. If we shift our focus, the ancient period of Jewish history may turn out to be the prelude to more dramatic accomplishments. Modern times, with all of its problematic anti-Semitism, may emerge as the heyday of Jewish significance. What all these ideologies, what all these Judaisms have in common is their creation by the Jewish people, their connection to the Jewish people. Judaism did not appear from above and beyond. It was made by us. It came from us and our experience. And it should serve us and our needs. Judaism has always evolved in response to new situations and outside influences. The Jewish tradition is change. Second, the greatest time in Jewish history is right now. Sherman had no nostalgia for the glory days of Abraham or the wisdom of Solomon. He points out that Solomon most likely was illiterate, let alone having written these wonderful books of wisdom of Proverbs and Song of Songs and Kohelet Ecclesiastes. These aren't wonderful books. They're wonderful books of wisdom, but they reflect the Hellenistic ethos centuries after Solomon would have lived. And not many kings were that literate anyway. It was the priests who did all the writing. Now, it's a little indelicate to point out that Solomon might have been illiterate. <laughs> but after all, provocative is not just the title of the book. <laughs> you see, it was critical for him to understand these traditional versions, to know the stories, but also to evaluate from our own perspective. Animal sacrifice is barbaric and primitive from a modern perspective. If anyone did it today, you would be shocked. Parochial chauvinism is a core element of biblical and early rabbinic literature. It's there. You can't deny it. So why deny it? Why not talk about it? Why not use that as a way to understand the past in the honest light of your own sensibility, your understanding of the world? <laughs> Sherwin wrote in his epilogue, the greatest era of Jewish history is now. Neither anti-Semitism nor the Holocaust can diminish the glory of the Jewish present. In fact, their virulence, including the virulence of religious fundamentalism, pays tribute to the provocative power and influence of the Jew and to the success of the Jew in a new and unsettling environment. Modern anti-Semites do not hate Jews because of their intense religious faith. They accuse the Jews of being the fomenters of atheism and radical change. They define them as devilish inventors of the global culture. Not even Zionism or the State of Israel has been able to undermine the image of the international Jew who conspires to undermine traditional values and structures of the old society. 
Everyone agrees that the Jews are smart, but not everybody agrees that they are good for the world. Nevertheless, despite all of that, the greatest time is now. The greatest era is the present. Never before have the Jews, individually and collectively, possessed more wealth, more power, and more influence. It's true. And I might add more freedom, at least in this country, if not in Israel. He points out that the Jewish experience may be the future. The commercial lifestyle they lived in feudal Europe was centuries ahead of its time. The diaspora experience, living as a dispersed people among a globalized world, was the forerunner of globalization. Many historians still maintain that monotheism and a compassionate ethics were the major contributions of the Jews. But monotheism is an increasingly problematic ideology in a secular world. And philosophic monotheism has its roots in many cultures. As for compassionate ethics, it is neither ethical nor empirically responsible for any nation to designate itself the inventor of ethics. <laughs> Given their history and influence, the Jews have been and remain provocative and extraordinary people, the unwitting precursors of a global world they helped to invent. Now why is this a secular history of the Jews? Because the focus is on this world on human motivations, on human experiences. It explains religious developments as a function of human needs, not of divine revelation. And it's taking ideas often as the excuse for why you do something when the real reason may often be something much more mundane. Now when you read the book, and I think to some extent it was a motivation for writing the book, you find the truth that studying Jewish history is Jewish practice. People ask, are you a practicing Jew? You can always respond, I don't need to practice, I'm an expert. <laughs> I've been doing it my whole life. But for us, doing Jewish is not just deepening your Jewish identity by reciting old prayers or studying the Torah again and again. We deepen our Jewish identity by learning where our people came from, how they came to be what they are today who they may become in the future. That, for us, is the study of Jewish history. That is the expression of a deep Judaism. The meaning of the Jewish experience to each of us and to all of us is the subject of this book and a core concern of humanistic Judaism as well. And last, humanistic Judaism is a wave of the future. Maybe not the wave, but certainly a wave. The last development discussed in the main text of the book in some ways, the pinnacle of Jewish history is humanistic Judaism. In fact, one of my saddest edits in the book was adding 2007 to the list of dates next to Sherman's name. Nevertheless, we cannot assume that we will speak for everyone, but as we know, and as this book demonstrates very clearly, the importance and power of the process of secularization of Jewish life over the past few centuries has been profound. The growth of reason and science as powerful tools to understand the world, to understand ourselves, to understand our past, the freedom of creativity that democracy has unleashed, the importance of community and roots in a fragmented and ever-changing world, all of these support the mission and the meaning of a humanistic Judaism. Now, Sherwin Wine did not invent the facts of Jewish history. He read them. He synthesized them. He understood the sweep of the Jewish experience. He drew lessons from it. Lessons about what happened and why. Lessons about what may yet happen and what can happen if we will it to be so. But now it really is up to us. I remember sitting in Genopolis. You got a Sherwin shrine if you're making the pilgrimage. <laughs> I was sitting in Genopolis uh, the evening before Sherwin's funeral with a number of our leaders. And I came up with an answer to the question that many people were asking, which was, who will replace Sherwin for humanistic Judaism? And the answer was, no one and all of us. No one will fill those shoes, but we have our own shoes, our own paths to walk, even if we might leave a little later in the morning. <laughs> but tonight, we have this latest gift. 
this sharing of knowledge, for all of his creativity and independent thinking, Sherman was in many ways a consummate rabbi. And if rabbi means teacher, then that work continues. So I want to stop here. I want to, again, thank all the people that I thank in the introduction and who have been thanked this evening and maybe have not been thanked here but deserve to be thanked. They should all be thanked. And most of all, I want to thank you who, having supported the work that Sherman did in the past, and most importantly, supporting the movement that he helped to create going forward, are really helping him to live forever. And so thank you very much.